again for each and every one that's here. We ask now, the Lord, for your blessings on our service today. I know we have a few out that are sick, or some with long-term sickness, some are not so long-term. But we ask the Lord that you'd be with them. I pray that you'd comfort their hearts. I pray for uh, that you'd touch their body and, and raise them up. We ask now for those that are going through trying situations, those who are having all sorts of unexpected uh, things happen in their life, that you'd comfort them. Help them know, while we may, they may be unexpected to us, nothing takes you by surprise. And we just thank you that we can trust in you. We ask now for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. 380, I'll go where you want me to go. song okay that's probably the second um, okay it's a good song I don't sing it a whole lot I probably should sing it a lot more so we're learning it then on the second Oh, 
Two ninety two. This is really a tremendous song. I don't know how well we know it. I don't sing it nowhere near enough, but um, I do love the song. So send I you. Pray what God will have you do with the faith promise. Um, we will have these cards. They're on the back table. Um, I probably should go ahead and pass those out, and I have not done that. Um, let's go ahead and do that after the offering. If, if you'll grab the cards and, and give them out, um, the blue cards on the back table, and give them out there by come when you come forward. Here, sit down. Yeah, just go ahead and give one nearby. This is just, you don't have to do it today, but this is this is the Faith Promise card. This is what we're aiming for, and, and it has information on here. I think our brother will explain it more to you, but it gives you an opportunity to give as you think God would have you give toward Faith Promise. Like I said, we're going to have another speaker in coming in on this, but my desire is for you to learn uh, God's method of supporting missions and that you would... Uh, pray about this, seek God's will, and I think it'd be a blessing for our church and for you personally. And I think the scripture that you presented this morning taught that perfectly, um, and I do appreciate that so much. So um, uh, you'll go ahead and pray and take the offering. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we're found in your house this day. We thank you that you so loved the world that you gave your only son. And we just pray, Lord, as we support the local church, we also support missions that your word would be proclaimed throughout the world and people be saved. 
So we just thank you for this opportunity to give, and may you bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, if you would turn in your song books to page uh, 412. 412. Um, if you've noticed, um, or if you have it, you will, if you're hanging around here long, I'm not a, a real refined person. I'm kind of rough around the edges. Um, brother, um, let's see if I get this right. Bell, bless, brother Bellow. You got it. Well, my mind keeps wanting to go right the other way. Well, my boy said that a hundred times, or it'd be starting to stick. I've been repeating that thing to myself continually. Um, I'm not a very refined person. I mean, I was raised out in the sticks. They had to pump sunshine in. Um, but, brother, you mentioned something close to that. We're in good standing. Uh, D.L. Moody wasn't a very refined man either, but God used him. And so... We're going, to, we're going to work and, and, and serve the Lord best we can. We're going to just trust Him to do the rest. Well, the, the whole key to serving God is you do all that you can do in your power, and when you reach the end of your rope, that's when God steps in. In our weakness, He's made strong. So praise the Lord for that. i got a lot of weaknesses. So 412, if you've got that, please stand. Rescue the parachute. <clears throat> Yeah. 
you may be seated. Pastor uh, Belvo, I probably butchered again, but anyway, if you come on. <laughs> I'm telling you, when he comes to butcher, I'm doing it pretty good. <laughs> anyway, thank you, sir. And you, um, have liberty. Well, it's good to be with Pastor Michael. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, honestly, I can tell you this. I've been called all sorts of things. Uh, church we attended when we lived in New Hampshire, we were called Mr. and Mrs. Buffalo. And uh, so I've been called a buffalo. I've been called all sorts of stuff. And I have thick shoulders, so I can take it. Okay, Brother Mitchell and uh, Mitchum. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is, to encourage you, we all have rough edges. And um, to be honest with you, when God called me to preach... Um, I one day was coming home from work and pulled my car over and just really was wrestling with the Lord and told the Lord, stop, I'm not going to do this. Now, I don't recommend you ever do that because you never win those arguments. <laughs> but, uh, you know, here I was telling the Lord that I wanted to serve him. He was telling me how he wanted me to do it. And I was telling him I wouldn't do that. I mean, you can pick something else, but I'm not going to do that. And um, it's, it's just it's the fact that it is God who does it. He works through imperfect people. He works through imperfect churches. And it's a good thing that he does. All right, I don't know. Exodus chapter 12, if you'll open your Bibles there. We're going to work through a lot of Scripture this morning. And uh, so I'm going to ask you to get your fingers ready. And um, I don't know... I know when I first started going to church, our pastor, you know, he would say, <clears throat> and I didn't know anything about the Bible. I started going to church. I wasn't saved yet. And uh, I got saved later. And I remember, you know, I'd go to church and, and our pastor would say, turn to Exodus chapter 12. And it would take me, you know, about 20 minutes to find the book of Exodus. You know, I'm looking at the table of contents and, you know, and, and then it's worse. He start, he's starting to read the text and I'm still looking for it. And everybody's sitting there prim and proper. And I'm trying to turn my pages without making any noise. You know, I don't want them to hear that. And, and then I'd find it, victory. And then he'd say, now turn to the book. of." And I think you got to be kidding me. And, uh, you know, and then it was re a real killer. I'd like you to now turn to the book of Hosea. Hosea, where's that? And uh, so I'll tell you what I started doing. I'm just a uh, fooey on this. Um, as soon as he starts reading, whatever book of the Bible I'm open to is what I'm going to be looking at. I'm just going to make it look good. That's all I care about. And so he might say Exodus chapter 12, and I could be in the book of Psalms, and I'd be sitting there looking at Psalms going, I have no clue what he's reading, but it doesn't matter. Nobody knows. And so if you can't find all the passages this morning, I'll never know. Just make it look good. Now, I don't know if everybody got, uh, got a card this morning, got a faith promise card. Um, but on there, you'll notice that it says, By faith I promise before God to give this amount above my tithe. Let me just clarify that whenever you do this, however you're going to do this, this is not your tithe. And you don't take from your tithe to give to, to missions. Okay, It's above and beyond your tithe. Um, and then you'll notice there are different amounts there, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, fifteen dollars, twenty dollars, other. If the amount is not there, you can put it there. And then you also have to clarify whether or not you're going to give that weekly, monthly, or yearly. Okay. The other key thing is that you notice there's no place to put your name because you will not be asked um, you will not be followed up on when this is done uh, by your pastor. This is between you and God. And so, um, you'll again, I don't know when you're going to do this. We do this every year in our missions conference in May. Um, and we, uh, we have several days. We bring in a guest preacher. And uh, we are challenged to pray about increasing our faith promise giving each and every year. And so uh, whenever you do that, just so you kind of understand that. Now, the reason uh, I hope you did get it, you kind of, I hope you kind of see the card, is because whenever this is presented, and I know it's called faith promise giving, I have no problem with that, and I don't lose sleep over 
uh, titles or those types of things. But I prefer to call it grace giving. And I'm going to show you why later this morning in a few minutes why I prefer to call it grace giving. I prefer to call it grace giving for missions. Um, but whenever this is promoted, uh, the question is asked, is this kind of giving biblical? And by the way, that's a good and valid question because if it's not biblical, then let's have nothing to do with it, Amen. period. Let's just you know, move on to the, to the thing that is biblical. And so it's a good and a valid question. So here's what I want to do. I want to see if I can uh, get us to ponder that question, is this giving biblical, by prodding our thinking by asking a couple of questions. Right? In other words, so we're asking the question, is it even biblical? I want to turn around. I want to say, well, let me ask you this. Okay. Number one. Is it um is giving to God and others ever unbiblical? I mean, is it ever ever unbiblical to give to God and to give to others? Can you ever find anywhere in the Bible where God says, Don't you give? I mean, it is Jesus who said in Luke 6, verse 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, shall men give into your bosom. It is Jesus who said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Secondly, is it ever unbiblical to give to missionaries? I mean, if we're asking the question, is it ever unbiblical? And this morning in Sunday school, we looked at the church in Philippi. And we looked at how they had given time again uh, to the Apostle Paul. And let me just give you something to think about. He was writing, remember, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So all of the words that we have on the pages of our Bible are God's words, right? Written through the pen of men, I understand that, but they're His words. So keep that in mind. When Paul was addressing the church in Philippi for their giving to him in, in his missions ministry, and they had recently given again, think about this, this is how he described it. Their giving, their act, their gift. He said it was, and I quote, a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. See, on that, I would say, I don't believe it's ever unbiblical to give to missions. I don't think it's ever unbiblical to give to the work of God. I don't think it's ever unbiblical to give to people in need and all those things. Now, we can't all meet everybody's needs. But if we're asking the question, is it biblical? I would come back with, I do know this, giving is most definitely biblical. That I do know. Now, my friend, Dr. Garvin Dykes, who's now in heaven, but he was a missionary spokesman. In a booklet that he wrote, he penned these words concerning giving. He said, and I quote, If we gave God everything we have, we could not enrich Him. And if we withheld everything, we would not impoverish Him. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and the beasts of the forest and field are His. However, now listen to this. He has bestowed upon us the great honor of allowing us to give Him something. Love that. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you consider giving to God and His work an honor or a hardship? What do you consider this? Is giving something that you are willing to do? Because at one time in their history, the children of Israel were certainly very willing to give to God. Now, this willingness was demonstrated shortly after their deliverance from their Egyptian taskmasters. God had been remarkably good to them, and He demonstrated His power in so many different ways. For example, He was victorious in a ten-round battle between Himself and the false gods of Pharaoh, and the Egyptians. Let's begin in Exodus chapter 12. If you would, we're going to begin in verse 29. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, 
from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And, <coughs> and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. Also, take your flocks and your herds as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. Now notice the urgency here of the Egyptians. And the Egyptians were urgent upon them. They're telling them, get out of town. <laughs> they were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes, Upon their shoulders. So God had delivered them. He not only did that, when He delivered them, He bestowed favor upon His people, perhaps even making certain that they were compensated for all of their years of slave labor. Let's pick it up in verse 34. Now we're going to read something here that is very significant that I ask you to make note of. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. Verse 34 is very significant. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. Mark that verse, mark what took place. So they're coming out, and they're com coming out with gold, silver, and jewels, as well as Cloth material, if I could put it to you that way, raiment from the Egyptians. Very significant. We'll see why in a moment. All right. Verse 36. And the Lord gave the people favor. Don't you love that? Mm. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Now notice this is significant. So that they lent unto them such things as they required. And they spoiled the Egyptians. And so God had finally set them free, and now He gave them favor in the eyes of the Egyptians and whatnot. He set them free and then led them as they, they made their way into the vast expanse of the wilderness. You know, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but you've been in Egyptian bondage for 400 years. You're now free. and You go out into this expanse. Well, which way do we go? And by the way, they didn't have iPhones with GPS on it. But they had God. You know what I've noticed? Even iPhones with GPS, you can still get lost. But if you follow God, you'll never get lost. Notice with me verse 51 of chapter 12. It says, And it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Let's go over to chapter 13, if you would. Verse 20. And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness Notice this, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So they had a visible, uh, a vi a visible um, marker of his presence, his leadership there in the camp. And then when Pharaoh and his men came in hot pursuit, believe it or not, Pharaoh decided, I'm going to try to get him back. We know that. And when he came in hot pursuit to try to take back his slave labor, it was the Lord who once again stepped in, protected Israel, and made certain that they would never return to Egyptian bondage. I'd like you to go to chapter 14 and notice with me verse 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. And you know, despite chronically complaining, which is, I'm sure, something that you never do. Despite chronically complaining, the Lord made certain that His people had adequate food and water as they journeyed with Him. 
I'd like you to go to chapter 16, if you would. There are multiple passages we could turn to. Let's just go to chapter 16. Notice verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that, was, uh, that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given to you, or given you to eat. The truth is, folks, God had been good to them. And hasn't God been good to you? Amen. I mean, don't you look back over your life and realize God has been so good to me. Now, eventually, the Lord commanded them to take up an offering. I'd like you to turn to chapter 35. Okay. Chapter 35. They're making their way through the wilderness, and at this point, God now is going to command them to take up an offering. All right, notice with me verse 4. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. And so he commands them now to take up an offering, and this offering is to be given to the Lord. Now, rest assured that this command was not issued because God needed anything from any of them. I mean, think about it. Everything he did up to that moment clearly proved that he needed nothing from the children of Israel. I mean, he was the one who set them free. He was the one who provided water. He was the one who provided uh, manna. He was the one who provided quails. He didn't need anything from them. That's not why he's issuing this command. I mean, he was the one who had parted the Red Sea and all of those things. It's not because he needed anything. This is why I go back to what my friend Brother Dyke said uh, when he wrote his booklet. He gives us the honor of giving to him. Now, in light of God's goodness, let me ask you this. Are you as willing to give to God as these and some others were? I want you to notice with me, we're going to build our way and we're going to kind of hedge a row all the way into the New Testament. So hang with me this morning, but we're going to get all the way into the New Testament. And I want us to look at it. We just said that, yes, God has been so good to me. So now we ask the question, God's been good to me. Am I willing to give? I mean, really, of my monetary material possessions, of my finances, am I willing to give to Him just as the Jews and others in the New Testament were? Follow with me, if you would. I want you to notice a few things about this offering before we get into the New Testament. I want you to hear with me, first of all, the command. All right? I want you to hear the command. Now, we just heard the command in a nutshell, but I'd like to pick it up in verse 4. We're going to read down several verses. <coughs> and here's what it says. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart. Now, I want to ask you to pay very close attention as we read through and hear this command. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the light and spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. And every wise-hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. Mark that. The tabernacle, his tent, and his covering, his tachets, and his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets, 
the ark and the staves thereof with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table and his staves and all his vessels and the showbread, the candlestick also for the light and his furniture and his lamps with, uh, with the oil for the light and the incense altar and his staves and the anointing oil and the sweet incense and the hanging for the door at the entering of the inn of the tabernacle. The altar of burnt offering with his brazen grate, his staves and all of his vessels, the laver and his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars and their sockets, and the hanging for the door of the court, the pins of the tabernacle and the pins of the court and their cords, the cloths of service to do service in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office." Now, I'd like you to look at those verses, and I, I really do. I, I often I do this because I want you to look at your Bibles. I want you to give thought and consideration and think through what we just read. As we listen to this command, I want you to notice as you skim through those verses that the command was for all who was, and I quote, of a willing heart. Would you mark that? So all who of a willing heart were to bring an offering to God for the purpose of constructing the tabernacle. Now, I want to assure you that God is not going to command you to give an offering of sweet incense and uh, ram skins dyed red and badger skins. And aren't you glad for that? I mean, that's not what he's going to command us to do. But this was going to be the construction of the tabernacle. And for just a moment to think of the significance of that structure. This would be the sanctuary where according to Exodus 25, verse 28, God would dwell among them. Right? Have you ever read this and thought to yourself, where'd they get all that? May I remind you, they've just been set free from slavery. Where'd they get gold? Where'd they get silver? I believe it was given to them from the Egyptians. Do you remember when we read back in chapter 12? They borrowed gold, silver, brass, cloth. God knew what he was doing. And in a sense, I think it's almost as if God said, I'm going to make, all right, you've been slaving away for all these hundreds of years. Here's your compensation. But isn't it interesting? Now he comes and he says, now I want you to give it all back. Not to the Egyptians, but to me. Because I want to dwell among you. Then if you continue to read the command, you'll notice that those with skill in certain areas were told to come and make all that the Lord had commanded. So the offering involved the giving of treasures, time, and talent. And God wanted it to be, this is so important, He wanted it to be of a willing heart. He mentions that a couple of times. It's just so important that you get that. Now again, I want to remind you, God does not need us, nor does He need anything from us to accomplish His work. Can I, can I tell you something? Do you know that God doesn't need any one of us? He doesn't need a missionary. He doesn't need any local church to get the gospel around the world. Folks, He created our world in six days by the sound of His voice. Does He sound like He needed any help? That God's up in heaven going, man, how am I going to get this message out? He doesn't need anything from us. However, he has chosen to use us and the generosity of His people to accomplish His work. And I want to assure you that He still loves it when His people give willingly and joyfully. God still loves that. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 says, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart. Do you see a, a correlation? To the Jews, he said, I want it to be of a willing heart. In the New Testament, he says, as you purpose in your heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, I'm going to say this, and your pastor may not want me to say this, but whenever you do your faith promise, you don't have to do it. Because right. the truth is, God says, I really want it to come from a very willing heart. I want you to want to do this. And I love a cheerful giver. So that's the command. I'd like you to notice with me, secondly, as we continue to look at this offering, I want you to notice the response. All right? The response. So let's pick it up in verse 20 of chapter 35. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. 
And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering. And notice it's the Lord's offering. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for the holy garments. And they came. Notice this, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, note that, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold. And every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of, uh, of rams and badger skins brought them. In other words, what that means is that someone went home and said, I don't have any gold. But hey, wait a minute. I got, hey, get that purple robe out of the closet. We can give that. Everyone that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering to and every man with whom was found shittim wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were wise-hearted, listen up women, the women were involved. And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate spice and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought, notice, a willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. Again, I want you to notice in verse 29 that it was both men and women who were willing to bring an offering to the Lord. I mean, it says that they brought a willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman, notice, whose heart made them willing to bring. And by the way, they gave what God had given to them. Think about it. All of this stuff was given to them by the Egyptians, really by the work of God. Remember, it was the Lord who showed them favor when they got those things. So you know what they're doing is they're giving back to God what he had given to them. But he was, they were also giving what they had in possession. That's why I pointed out that some maybe didn't have as much gold or silver, but they found purple or they found blue or they found uh, some said, I've got wood. I can bring that. What, but we got something that we can give. All of us can give something in this. So let's give. They invested their time and their talents in the construction of the tabernacle. And by the way, this was not a one-time offering either. Did you know that? Let's go to chapter 36, verse 2. And Moses called Bezalel and Ohioleb and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. And they received of Moses, notice, all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it with all. Now notice this last statement. And, and they brought yet unto him free offerings one time. Is that what it says? They brought him free offerings every morning. I mean, the children of Israel are so willing to give to God that every morning they brought, to use the Bible terminology there, free offerings. Those are offerings that were not commanded of God. They were given freely of their own choice. It's as if some of them said, why stop at that? Let's just keep giving. So you've heard the command. You've seen the response. Now I'd like you to notice the restraint. Chapter 36, notice verse 5. <clears throat> and they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. You know what they said? They said, Moses, the people have brought way more than we need. 
And Moses, verse 6, <clears throat> gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. For the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. So Moses now has to go out and he has to say, whoa, 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 stop, stop, bring that back. They, they've got way more than they need. We don't need anything else. Now, I don't know what you would do if your pastor ever stood up and said, you know what? We're not going to take any offerings for the next month and a half. You folks are giving way too much. In fact, don't bring any money to church for the next month. Okay. Have you ever had that happen here, pastor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've never had a church tell me we have more money than we know what to do with. We're not, we're not taking any more. I, if I take an offering, I mean, I don't, they just keep giving and giving and giving. And I mean, we have to tell them, we, we, we check them at the door. You bring in your wallet, leave it in the car. We don't want any money today. <laughs> but in a sense, that's what's going on here. I mean, they're giving so much that the workers are coming and saying, we can't, we don't, we can't use all this stuff. You got to send them back home and tell them, don't bring any more. Now, it would be a great problem if we had that in our churches. And I think if that we had that problem, I'd say, well, you know what? We don't need it, but other ministries do, so let's just share it with others if you're going to be that generous. But I think that would be the only time that God would restrain us from giving. Now, <clears throat> a few moments ago, I mentioned others who were willing to give, others in the New Testament. So I'd like you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Okay, in Corinthians chapter 8. And uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 are the key passages for faith, promise, giving, grace, giving. <clears throat> if you were able to be with us in Sunday school, we looked at the church in Philippi, and I had asked you to make mental note of the fact that the church in Philippi was located in Macedonia. That's a very significant piece of information when it comes to this matter of giving. And so they're located in Macedonia. They had given, they had financially, monetarily contributed to the Apostle Paul and his ministry several times. We saw it. They had recently done it when he wrote the book of Philippians. But keep in mind that this is a church located in Macedonia. Now, let me just give you a little bit of backdrop so you understand what's taking place. The church in Jerusalem were being ostracized, I guess you could say, for their faith in Christ. They were losing jobs. Businesses were being revoked and shut down uh, and many other things. And because of that, the people in the church in Jerusalem were experiencing some extremely financially hard and trying times. So in a moment, we're going to read this. The churches in Macedonia became aware of that. And they decided that they wanted to help. They wanted to provide a bit of relief financially if they could. So the churches in Macedonia began to take up offerings, not for themselves, but for the church in Jerusalem. So these offerings were going to be entirely for other people, other Christians. You follow what I'm saying? And so, and they, they made an agreement with the Apostle Paul, we'll take the offering if you'll deliver it to the church in Jerusalem. Now, the church in Corinth was not in Macedonia, but they wanted to get in on this, and they had decided that they were also going to take an offering uh, to also contribute to the needs there in Jerusalem. They, however, had not come through with their promise. So Paul's writing here to urge them to come through with their promise. You promised that you would give to this, and you haven't done it, and so now we're, I'm asking you. And he's going to use the churches in Macedonia as an example. Notice with me, if you would, chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, we want you to know, that's what that phrase means, we do you to wit of the grace of God, bestowed on the churches, plural, of Macedonia. All right, now keep in mind, one of those would have been the church in Philippi. <laughs> if you were here in Sunday school, they were a giving church, right? Gave multiple times the Apostle Paul. Located, keep it in mind because of what we're about to read, to me is a very challenging when you understand all the background. 
This is also why I like to call it grace giving, because you'll notice that Paul said, I want you to know of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. What they did, he said, they did by the grace of God. All right, verse 2. How that in a great trial of affliction, the, deep, uh, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. Now, st- this is the verse that challenges me. The churches in Macedonia, Philippi being one. Now, let me just challenge you with something. If you're sitting here and you think, I cannot afford to give to missions. This is one of the most challenging verses every time I want to use that argument. Now, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God chooses His words carefully. It's very important sometimes you slow down when you read and you digest word for word. And I believe this is one of those verses. These churches in Macedonia were experiencing, notice this, affliction. Now you can relate to that, right? We all have hardships. We all carry burdens. However, would you look at your Bible? I want you to not look at me for the next couple minutes. I want you to look at God's Word. I want you to... Affliction is one thing. But I want you to notice how God described this. How that in a great trial of affliction. Folks, that's different than an affliction. A great trial of affliction means that probably some of those church, believers in the Macedonian churches, the church in Philippi, they were probably suffering immensely. We're not talking about just having a rough week here. We're talking about some serious gut-wrenching pain. All right, but keep looking at that verse. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, isn't that interesting? Even in deep sorrow, we can still have great joy. Amen. It didn't sour them. Notice this. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, now notice this, and their deep poverty. Now, it would have been one thing if God would have said poverty. We can relate to that. I don't think I'm speaking to multimillionaires. If you are, your pastor's wanting to know where you're hiding the millions. I don't know. <laughs> You probably all go, I live on a fixed income, tight budget, am I right? Uh, We pray that nothing goes wrong this month because there's no wiggle room in the budget for anything to go wrong, right? But let me just, for a moment, look at the verse again. They were going through deep poverty. If there was any, any churches who could say, we can't give to help other believers, it was these churches. If there was ever a church who could say, we can't give to missions, it was the church in Philippi. But what did they do? In their affliction, in their deep poverty, they gave to missions time and again. What did they do? In their affliction, in their deep poverty, they gave to help those those believers in Jerusalem. How did they do that? Paul said, the grace of God. Now he continued in verse 3. He said, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power. So they, they gave beyond their ability and they gave within their ability. But notice something. Remember, we're taught this is the key to everything I'm trying to get across. They were willing of themselves. They didn't have to have their arm twisted. This was something they were willing to do. Verse 4. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship. Remember what we said? See, this isn't just sitting around and encouraging. This is getting involved. Maybe Paul tried to tell them, you folks, you can't give to this offering. You guys can't make it yourself. And I can see them saying, we want to give. Don't you dare rob us of our blessing, Paul. To the ministering of the saints. And then it says in verse 5, and this they did. Not as we hoped. Now notice this. But first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. In closing, very quickly, I want you to look at verse number one. And again, I want you to notice. 
He said, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, and we want you to know of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Have you ever considered how exciting and important God's grace is in your life? Very quickly, let me just give it to you. Number one, we're saved by His grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Folks, every person who gets to heaven gets there by the grace of God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. No one will get there because they work their way there. Amen. We're saved by His grace. But you know what else? We're transformed by His grace. See, we need radical change. Because we're so sinful. And in His grace, God changes us and shapes us and molds us. Uh, I, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you can look back from the day that you were saved to where you are now and can say, you know what, there's been a, some changes. God has changed me. I'm not the person I used to be. And you look at it and you go, thank God for that. Folks, that's His grace. 1 Corinthians 15, I love these verses. The Apostle Paul said, For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. God's grace had changed him. Thirdly, we are enabled by God's grace. You were talking about having, you know, a lot of uh, uh, flaws or whatever word it was you used. You know what? Uh, the truth of the matter is, anything that we do for God, any work that we accomplish is really by His grace. Paul went on in that verse, he said, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. We're saved by His grace. Formed by His grace, we're enabled by His grace. We are enabled to suffer by His grace, if that's His will for us, according to 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. It is God's grace that enables us to live for Him each day. But guess what? It is also God's grace that enables us to give of our financial resources, no matter how limited they may be. Again, one last time. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberal out, liberality. Think of it this way. God's grace is saving grace. It is transforming grace. It is enabling grace, but it is also giving grace. So to us today, God says, listen, <clears throat> to suffering destitute Christians in Macedonia, I imparted to them giving grace. And I can impart the same giving grace to you. But here's his question this morning, and only you can answer this. Are you willing to become a recipient of my giving grace. Amen. Do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to say, Lord, I want you to give me the grace to dig deep into my wallet and give to missions? I don't see how this can work except by your grace. And I want that grace. God says, guess what? If you want it and you ask for it, I'll give it. And you'll be amazed how much you'll be able to give. Not by your resources, but by my grace. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray this morning that you'd encourage us <clears throat> that, Lord, we can give. Uh, Lord, you have the grace to give us and you want to enable us to give. And I just pray that, Lord, this helped. We've looked at a lot of scripture. But, Lord, I just ask that you just um, move and work in the hearts of your people. Use this church. Lord, bless this church. Lord, I pray you give them fruit for their labors as they try to reach people here in Nanaimo. I pray you give them a unified spirit to do so. Lord, I, I would ask that you would just uh, also give them a unified spirit missions and in giving to missions. And Lord, that you just would encourage them 
The size of their church does not matter to you. Lord, the size of our budgets and our <clears throat> paychecks doesn't matter to you. Your grace is infinite. And Lord, you've got grace to give each and every one if we're just willing to be recipients of it. And so, Lord, I pray that in the days ahead, you'll do marvelous things that only you can do for your honor and glory here at Harbor Baptist Church for the cause of Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Mitchum, if you'd like to come. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that very much. Um, I would, I love the passage he was in, 2 Corinthians 8. And I, 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 I go to verse 8. It says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the boldness of others to prove the sincerity of your love. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You know, that's talking about the grace of God. And that's what, that's what really, whether it be called grace giving or, or faith promise or whatever you, else you want, that's what giving is. It's by the grace of God. And it's that we might, through our riches or abundance, um, and, and, you know, I say that saying, I know we don't, None of us are rich, so to speak. But whatever we have, God has given us. And, and, and he's enriched us with that. And as we give back, uh, God blesses us through that. Uh, tremendous. I appreciate that, brother. Thank you so much. 435. What will you do with Jesus? Um,